Zoll has pushed the boundaries of what is possible for 35 years. In the tradition of company co-founder Paul Zoll, Alaska award-winning physician and a pioneer in pacing and defibrillation. In addition to his seminal research, Dr. Zoll had a reputation for dedication and careful attention to his patients. His legacy lives on at Zoll. These are my official conflicts of interest. I am an eMERGE physician, an EMS physician, and I work with a fairly large uh, uh, province-wide um, EMS platform. I'm fortunate to have these academic and financial conflicts of interest showing you here in terms of working with the American Heart as the BLS Science Editor for the recent Guideline Productions and my academic conflicts of interest is being able to work with the leadership of Gavin Perkins as the BLS co-chair and being involved as an author in some of the resuscitation guidelines. My personal conflicts of interest is that I prefer motorcycles over cars and a controversial statement that I do like dogs more than cats. <laughs> and I want to put this out in terms of things, an invitation, especially for some of the residents and medical students that are here. I'm happy to share the slides. If they resonate with you, just email me and I am happy to share them with you and that stuff as you build your own kind of slide decks and further progress in your career. So this is what a layperson is facing. All the things that they can do, the interventions, the issues related to responding to someone who's in a cardiac arrest. And when they pick up one of these things to look at, for example, compression-only CPR, they got to get the evidence straight. They got to get the evidence first, for, foremost, and then get it straight, and then actually get the evidence used. And we call that knowledge translation. And that's how I'm going to frame the context of this talk, walking you through the processes of getting the evidence, getting the evidence straight, and getting the evidence used, using layperson CPR as the focus of this uh, conversation. So first and foremost, getting the evidence. We're all evidence-based practitioners. We know that when you do that, you have to come up with a well-thought-out question. And this is the history of the layperson PICO since 2000, how it's changed and morphed over time. It began with, is compression-only CPR safe, effective, and feasible? When should ventilation begin? And doctors Mosesso and Koster were the two worksheet authors that formulated the consensus with that question in hand. In 2005, 2010, ILCOR applied the PICO methodology the idea that every single question has well thought out population intervention comparison outcome. And as you see here, this is the question that we tried to answer in that evidence cycle. In 2010, the adult question was refined even further. In 2005, 2010, it was talking about compressions of ventilations, of compressions without ventilations from bystanders, both trained and untrained. And we refined that even further by saying laypersons in the 2010 to 15 cycle. And you see the outcome is much more robust. The beauty behind GRADE is it makes you choose the outcomes that are important. Neurologically intact survival one year after the event. That was like the gold star kind of outcome they wanted to have compared to ROSC, which was an outcome ranked a little obviously lower than that. And in the 2010 to 2015 cycle, pediatrics came on board. And there was a team of people that looked at this question and tried to navigate the issues relevant to the evidence on pediatric compression-only CPR. Now, the question that they asked me to address today is, lay person, compression-only CPR, is it ready for prime time? And I think it is, but I want to show you the reasons why. These are the publications in the COSTAR from 2015, 19 citations spanning across the globe 35 years, and what I'm showing you here is the evidence iterative process up into the 2015 consensus. And I wholeheartedly acknowledge that there's still a wealth of knowledge from the C2015 going forwards that is yet to be included in terms of the evidence evaluation. That's the beauty behind the work that ILCOR is doing in terms of a continuous evidence review. But what I'm showing you here is not having some of the citations that Dr. Morley had shown this morning, for example, with Professor Iwami with that beautifully large registry data that involves layperson compression-only CPR. Six studies in North America, on into Europe, we have Belgium, Netherlands, Sweden, Norway, and six studies from the RCA. And on behalf of Canada, thank you to the RCA in particular for deriving a massive volume of knowledge on this topic and looking forward to synthesizing that information even further. 
So getting the evidence straight. Once we have the evidence in hand, you saw some of the tools that Dr. Morley had shown you about using a grade platform to look at things. There's a risk of bias tables. These are the clinical trials for the adult body of knowledge. And I just draw your attention, one of the important things on this is with respect to the standard CPR arm, which is right here. I won't move that mouse too much. It's going to be a little bit twitchy there. But I draw your attention to the standard CPR. A subtle thing that you'll see that comes back to haunt these citations in terms of indirectness. Is it truly against 30 and 2 CPR? And it's not. These studies were done in those time frames that you can see under the standard CPR column. These were studies hard to blind, and so they did score down poor in terms of not being able to blind compression-only CPR versus standard CPR, but that's intuitive. And with respect to things, the overall, the clinical trials moved forward without any serious biases as we moved to construct the evidence profile tables. For the observational studies here, I draw your attention again to the standard CPR column, the SCPR. Because the comparison group has been the standard of CPR defined by that time frame in which that observational study was done. And we're getting more of that information moving forward from C2015 about current CPR comparison groups. But the body of knowledge that spanned the 35 years had different types of CPR to compare compression only to. I also like to draw your attention to the massive volumes, patient populations of 12,000, 16,000, 17,000 in terms of some of these studies. And the exciting part is that new evidence that's coming that's even larger with regards to the, uh, the study volume. The issue about the observational studies is that you see a lot of red in there. And it's because there are, using this uh, strategies here, there are some potential biases in the observational data. So most of these observational studies, when carried forward into the next step of grade, got a hit as a source of serious bias uh, in the study methodology. So this is an evidence profile table to introduce to people in terms of navigating it. You, when you look at this table towards the left-hand side is the assessments of quality, and you'll see the words serious, non-serious, et cetera. As you've heard, clinical trials start off as high quality and get scored down. Observational studies start off at low quality and maybe scored up. And the idea is that there's five questions that you're looking at scoring down. Risk of bias, imprecision, indirectness, inconsistency, publication bias. And there's three things that can actually bump a study back up again. Did they control confounders really well? Was there a large treatment effect? Was there a dose response type of curve? And you guys as EVREVs or people as EVREVs go through and look at the methodology and score these kinds of studies. But let's zoom in on this a little bit further. 1,300 patients where we were looking at the clinical outcome was survivable to one year favorable neurological outcome. You start off with the outcome into these tables. There was one study, 1,300, pa 1300 patients but considered low quality, or very low quality, because they got few hits against it, imprecision, indirectness, because it wasn't the 30 and 2 that we're looking for. And the risk of bias that was carried forward from that table that I showed you, but essentially showing no difference between compression-only CPR and standard CPR. On to the next table, survival, 30 days, favorable neurological outcome, 40,000 patients. Observational studies, very low quality. Again, hit because of a risk of bias and indirectness. Again, the comparison group, was it 30 and 2? Standard CPR by today's definitions. Again, no differences statistically between compression only and standard CPR. The Svensson study at the bottom, a clinical trial, 1,200 patients, starts off at high quality, but brought down because of indirectness. Is it standard CPR by the definitions as we define here today? Again, showing no difference between compression-only CPR. Another set of uh, information from the adult literature as we go on to it, as the less prioritized outcomes begin to appear, let's look at that even further. Survival, 30 days, no neurological outcome reported. 11,000 11, cases, very low quality scored because of risk of bias, indirectness. You see a common theme on this. No difference between the intervention and comparison groups. Survival, 14 days, favorable neurological outcome. One study, very low quality, no difference. Survival, DC, favorable neurological outcome, clinical trial. The Ray study moved from high quality to low quality because of indirectness. Again, not the standard 30 and 2 CPR as we would define today. And last, the survival DC favorable neurological outcome, 2,200 patients, 
three uh, very low quality clinical studies scored because of uh, indirectness, risk of bias, uh, and observa their observational studies. Again, no difference between the two treatment arms. And lastly, the last grade table, or Evans profile table, as we're going through in the lower prioritized outcomes, survival DC, no neuro report outcome, clinical trial, HALSTROM, a moderate clinical trial, no difference between the treatment arms, and survival DC, no neuro reported, two observational data, very low quality, no difference. The pediatric studies, there was much less. There was five studies, a bit of contamination, because some of the PED studies were banked into some of the adult studies. But the assessors that looked at this felt that there wasn't any uh, major sources in the clinical trial of biases carrying forward in terms of risk of bias. And there was some moderate risk of bias for the observational studies based on their assessment. The table here is structured a little bit differently, essentially showing no difference between compression-only CPR and standard CPR for the outcomes of survival at hospital discharge. But more importantly is the second table. And you as users can see these tables. You can go to ILCOR. Org, and from that, bring you on to Sears, where you can actually view and navigate some of these tables and understand how, they, how they're actually working. But this is where some of the interesting thing in pediatrics comes through. Neurologically intact survival at 30 days in a clinical trial, sorry, an observational study moved from low quality to moderate quality because of the large treatment effect based on the assessing, the viewers that assess this, a strong association seen of actually improved outcomes in standard CPR in pediatric cardiac arrests. And at the bottom one, neurologically intact survival with the dispatch-assisted compression-only CPR as a comparison group that actually improved outcomes in the comparison group of standard CPR in an observational study that it was uh, scored because of, uh, I believe, indirectness and then brought back up again because of strong association that was seen by the evidence reviewers. So at this point, you're probably lost in terms of data and evidence profile tables. But the writers at COSTAR and ILCOR, et cetera, take these evidence profile tables and through consensus, try to get the evidence used. And the way they do that is they try to give information to you to say, this is what you should do. And from that, the consensus in science on the adult reads, we recommend that chest compression should be performed for all patients in cardiac arrest. Strong recommendation very low quality evidence. The transparency that Dr. Morley was illustrating that grade gives you. In pediatrics, we recommend that rescuers provide rescue breasts and chest compressions for pediatric in hospital and hospital cardiac arrests. If rescuers cannot provide rescue breasts, they should at least perform chest compressions. Strong recommendation, low quality evidence. That's the what. That was the treatment recommendations from COSTAR. And here's what I want to do. I want to walk across things globally and show you then about untrained lay people and trained lay people, lay persons. I'm going to start in no particular order. I come from Canada, so I'm going to put up our council guidelines that we work in partnership with American Heart. The 2015 recommendations, slightly different language in terms of the, you'll see here in terms of the class and uh, level of evidence. But untrained lay rescuers should provide chest compression only CPR with or without dispatch assistance. Class one, strong recommendation, level of evidence, limited data. The rescuer should continue compression only CPR until the arrival of an AED or rescuers with additional training. Class one, strong recommendation, level of evidence C, limited data. The language that the American Heart and Heart Stroke uses to translate the grade recommendations into guidelines. For trained rescuers at the bottom, all lay rescuers should, at a minimum, provide chest compressions for victims of cardiac arrest. If the lay trained rescuer is able to perform rescue breasts, he or she should add rescue breasts in a ratio of 30 compressions to two breasts, and they should continue CPR until an AED arrives or EMS arrives. And I want to show you some of the language used across councils. For pediatric, before we switch gears for American Heart and Heart and Stroke, I'll draw your sentence to the uh, last sentence here. Because compression-only CPR is effective in patients with a primary cardiac event, if rescuers are unwilling or unable to deliver breasts, we recommend rescuers perform compression-only CPR for infants and children in cardiac arrest. But to be very clear, the pediatric BLS guidelines read, conventional CPR, chest compressions, and rescue breasts should be provided for pediatric cardiac arrests. Class one recommendation, strong recommendation, level evidence, uh, 
level B non-randomized uh, trials. Let's switch gears, look at the ERC. The ERC and their guidelines that came out, I draw your attention to the bottom part of the slide here, where they talk about if untrained or unable to rescue breasts, continue compression-only CPR. So it's one of the questions about, as a trained rescuer, it's pretty clear at this point between two councils, if you're untrained, it's compression-only. If you're trained, are you pulled towards doing standard CPR, or are you pulled from standard CPR to compression-only CPR based on if you're able or unable? And I'll show you more of that in just a moment, something to ponder in terms of opportunities and knowledge gaps going forwards. But in the ERC and the algorithms, they read that for untrained compression only, and if you're unable to rescue breasts, then compression only. What's nice in the ERC is they've also challenged some of the things, but the confidence about the evidence between changing practices are there. And so rescuers, if you're trained, you should be doing ventilations in cardiac arrest, similar to what the AHA had said in terms of things. Let's switch gears again to PEDS BLS, the ERC. I'll read you the last sentence here. It is better to provide rescue breasts as part of the resuscitation sequence when applied to children, as the asphyxial nature of most pediatric cardiac arrests necessitates ventilation as an effective part of CPR. We'll move from ERC into Australia. All rescuers should perform chest compressions for those who are unresponsive and not breathing normally. Anne's course suggests that those who are trained and willing to give breasts do so for all persons in cardiac arrest. If rescuers do continuous chest compressions, they should be at a rate of approximately 100 to 120 per minute. From Australia into the RCA, on the adult, BLS are things, there'll be more talks on this, but the algorithm that's available, well, if you hone in on this and take a peek at it and zoom into it, it reads, if trained, able, and willing to give rescue breasts for people responding, uh, lay people responding to cardiac arrests. And we'll switch gears again to the Resuscitation Council of South Africa. And the way it reads when you zoom in on its program is, if unable to give breasts, push on the chest repeatedly. So COSTAR and the guidelines, the councils have come out and they've told you what to do. If you're untrained, compression only. If you're trained, and able to give ventilations, you should do that. If you're unable, you should go down to compression-only CPR. So is compression-only CPR ready for prime time? Yeah, it is. There's still some work and refinement that needs to be done on things here, though, and let me expand this a little bit more. Did you notice that for trained rescuers, there's certain language there that pushes you from one to the other? The adult co-star, AHA, Heart and Stroke, ERC in the text, and the RCA, and the PEDS ERC say if you're able to do ventilations, do 30 and 2. But there's other kind of language in the, in the guidelines that says if you're not able to do ventilations, as a lay person, do compression only. Examples, the PEDS co-star, the AHA PEDS, Heart and Stroke PEDS, uh, South Africa PEDS, and the adult ERC algorithm, and the RCSA. And I think that's the challenge about guidelines, is that they tell you what to do, and we're starting to get more knowledge on how to do it. And that's a bit of the challenge for us here. And I'm going to illustrate that a bit further by a diagram that we published in 2010 talking about the building blocks of CPR. Wherever you are, the foundation is you have to have quality chest compressions going. You never want to sacrifice those quality chest compressions. Rate, depth, recoil, minimal pauses, avoid excessive ventilation, et cetera. That's common wherever you were working. But the idea is to become more proficient at things from no training, to become highly trained. This whole issue of sequencing changes. Is it compression only? Is it CAB in 30 and 2? Or when it's multi rescue coordinated CPR, is there actually no sequence because everything happens at the same time? But even this diagram still doesn't give us help on it. For a layperson, what decision tools can they have to say, I'm able or I'm not able? And I think that's one of the things we're looking forward, information from the Education Implementation and Teams Task Force and ILCOR and, and the new direction where things are going, but trying to give some of those decision tools to lay people. And if you actually look at things and ask some people, and this is not based on evidence, this is not evidence-based decision-making, 
This is decision-based evidence making in many ways because I'm just showing you my perspective on things. That there's resources available to a lay person. That resource could be a phone. And the guidelines across councils say keep the phone with you, call early access, etc. But your resource may be a phone. And your resource may be an AED, which is in the same building as you. And the resource may be another rescuer who's a layperson who can help out. And then there's other things too in terms of environment. Is it an optimal environment or a suboptimal environment? And the question is, as if you're untrained, compression only CPR is the way to go. But if you're trained in CPR, making that decision, am I able or not able? And when do I switch from one to the other? We need some work on. And the exciting part here and my biases that come through is that that call gives you some navigation tools to help out with that. The idea that dispatcher CPR, the telephone CPR, some of the new ways that we're going that you saw here that Dr. Morley had shown about the call that begins with whatever you're doing to activate your emergency response system may actually help that lay person make that decision, am I able, doing 30 and 2, am I unable, doing compression only. So guys, thank you very much for your attention and time. If there's any questions, please email me.